a blowout, eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits on a 3-0 finish. He swings, and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone, home run, and a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flippin' Bats presented by Mattress Firm. They got their own beautiful locker up here on our beautiful set. Uh, so this is presented by Mattress Firm. And guys, I just got back from Iowa. The Field of Dreams. I can't wait to tell you guys all about my experience and share everything. I was in the middle of corn for 48 to 72 hours. I got lost in the corn. I'll be sure to tell you about all of that. And I'm also going to bring on special guest Kevin Burkhart, who was there on the TV side of things, a legend of the game. He's covered World Series. He's covered Super Bowls. He covers basketball. He's literally a jack of all trades and somebody that I very much so respect in the game. So can't wait to talk to him about his experience. And then we'll get into this week and Shohei Otani news, my favorite segment, because I love the guy. So can't wait to get to that segment. And then at the end, I'm going to do a little, uh, a fun little segment and talk about some other places that I'd like to see a game like that played. You know, the Field of Dreams is kind of a one-off. Like, one, one game we get to see in an awesome location. They're going to end up doing it again. But I want to talk about a few other locations that I'd like to see them do that and have some fun with that. But look, right off the top, rounding the bases, I can't stress enough how incredible this experience was and I'm going to share that with you guys because it was it was truly magical for lack of a better word it was magical and I pull up I've been driving for three hours all I'd seen was corn 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 that's all I was seeing and then out of nowhere literally out of nowhere this beautiful house shows up next to a beautiful baseball field and look, I've, I've seen the movie Field of Dreams a bunch of times, but pulling up to this location and seeing it rise literally out of, literally out of the corn was, was perfect. It was absolutely incredible. And then I turn down the, uh, down the driveway and pull down the driveway, and I literally just, I got the chills. I got the chills rolling up to this. It was really, really special. So make this long drive. I pull up out of the middle of nowhere, and it's there right in all of its glory get out of the car and walk up to it. And the first thing I did, the first thing I did was FaceTime my dad on the movie site field because that's what the movie's all about. That's what, the, that's what the movie comes to, is having a catch with your dad on the field. And that was just an awesome, just literally from the ride up, from the drive up to this, uh, it, it was just the perfect start. It was literally the perfect start to these couple of days. And speaking of the perfect start, what they did to start this game, having Kevin Costner, a legend, the actor, Ray Kinsella in the movie, what they did having him come out of the corn. Um, if you haven't watched, by the way, make sure you go watch the opening scene to this game. It's the pen tweet on the MLB at Fox social page. It's all over YouTube. Make sure you go see this because it's special. It really is. And I was there to be, I was in person, not far from where he came out of the corn watching this. And it was really a weird feeling in the stadium. It was, it was special. It was very special seeing him come out. And I thought a lot about this. This was more than an actor that played the lead role in a movie coming out of the corn at a baseball game in Iowa. It really was. This was special. This was about much more than that. And that's why, you know, there weren't a lot of dry eyes in the stadium when this was happening. This place was rowdy. The crowd was there three hours before the game even started, and they were pumped up the second they start playing the Field of Dreams music, which is how this started. They put the Field of Dreams music, they put a little video up on the board of Kevin Costner talking and, you know, walking around the corn, and the second that comes on, People weren't saying a word. The place goes silent. So then it all leads up to him saying his final words on the board and then walking through the corn. And then all of a sudden it's his back. You see his back walking through the corn. And then he walks out of the corn. And then he's onto the field. It was perfect. 
He walks out onto the field, and there weren't a lot of dry eyes in the place. And I did a lot of thinking about this, and, and I was emotional as well. And I'm not emotional because Kevin Costner's walking on a baseball field. I mean, that's cool, but that's not what makes me emotional. What makes me emotional is the connection to the movie, what, which is what they did so well the whole, the whole time throughout, what Major League Baseball did, what Fox did, what our TV crew did. They, all, they pulled it together so perfectly. And everybody was emotional because of the connection to the movie and how it ends with him and his father playing catch on the field, a father-son sort of relationship. And that's what my mind went to, was that movie and how awesome that moment was and how cool it was to have him walk out on this field, uh, onto this field. And then he turns around, he stops for a second, he turns around and the Yankees and the White Sox in their jerseys from back in 1919 walk through the corn out onto the field together. It was so cool. I get the chills just thinking about it. The entrance, the start to this whole experience, because this was more than just a game. This was an experience. And everybody killed it. Everybody knocked it out of the park. And the start to all of this was perfect. Kevin Costner walking out of the corn, turning around, having the perfect shot. This is what I loved the most. You know, all of this was so cool. But we, as on the TV side, got the perfect shot of this with him turned around looking at the corn. And from behind, the players start, walk, start walking out of the corn. The crowd goes nuts. I went nuts. I got emotional. It was so cool. So the start of the game was just perfect. They couldn't have done it any better. Kudos to Kevin Costner for, for just owning this. He absolutely killed it. This was, this was literally like a scene out of a movie. And him being who he is, an absolute legend, killed it. It was awesome. And then the game starts. And this was awesome. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you watched the game, but if you didn't, the game from the very beginning was awesome. Home runs left and right, good defensive plays. Jose Abreu gets it started with a home run to left field, who everybody there was saying, this is the first home run that has ever been hit in Iowa. Wrong. I hit a home run in Iowa a few years ago in Cedar Rapids. I didn't hear many people talking about that. Not sure why, but I digress. Jose Abreu hits the first major league home run in the state of Iowa, which was awesome. And you know what resulted from that? A bunch of other home runs. This game was awesome. Literally, this special, magical game rises from the corn and 8,000 people in Iowa, in a, in a town that holds 4,000, 8,000 people show up to a game that was so special and watched by more than anybody in 16 years for a regular season game. And what resulted was the most incredible baseball game in a regular season that I have ever seen. And that's not an exaggeration here. The way this game ended, it was a three-run game going into the ninth inning. The Yankees take the lead. There are two outs, nobody on base. The Yankees score four runs, take the lead. Everybody's saying, wow, what a crazy game this turned out to be. You know what happened in the bottom of the ninth? I couldn't have scripted this any better. I couldn't have, Hollywood couldn't have, because everybody would say, this is too unrealistic. This is too cheesy. No way this happens. The number nine batter gets on base. And then in the bottom of the ninth inning, Tim Anderson hits a walk-off home run on the first pitch, sending the crowd into a frenzy. Fireworks are going off in the background. I, it couldn't have been a more perfect scene. I truly believe that this was the best regular season game that I have ever seen. Now, look, have there been better baseball games on the field? Sure, there's a few that come to mind. Of course, there, were, there have been some incredible regular season baseball games. But let me tell you this. There has never been a game like this. There has never been a game this magical. This was more than a baseball game. There are 162 baseball games that every team plays. And this is just another one of them. What made this one special was more than just the incredible game on the field. It was the magic 
of the whole experience. It was the magic of the fans. It was the magic of the corn. It was the walk-off. It was everything combined that made this so magical and that made this the best regular season game that I have ever experienced. This game was viewed by more people than there has been in, in 16 years. This was the most viewed regular season game in 16 years. That's special. That's special. And it's, it wasn't just because of this game. And what ended up was, the, was a perfect, a perfect baseball game. But what made this experience special for me was everything from start to finish. From, from what I told you about earlier, from coming up to the field, from driving up to the field, from driving down the driveway, out of nowhere, out of corn rises this place, to, to this game. Everything in between is what made this so special for me. I got there and I get out of the car and I come walking over for the first time. I've never gotten to experience this. I've never experienced the Field of Dreams. I've seen the movie a million times and I had really high expectations. But this, I was blown away. I was, this blew it out of the water. You come over and, and this is basically the shot you get. You come up, you see the house from the movie over on your right, the baseball field down on your left, all of the corn, and it quickly becomes like, this is, this is more than just what you see in a movie. This is actually special. There's really something special and magical about this place. So I go over to the baseball field, I FaceTime my dad, um, and then from there, I actually go up to the house. And I wasn't sure what made this experience so cool is the access. I had no idea the access that I'd have. I, I, I walked right into the house. I go over there, I'm like, I, man, this is so cool. Maybe I can get in. I did. I went right in. There was nobody that stopped me. I don't know if I was supposed to. I don't know if I accidentally broke into the Field of Dreams home, but I went right on in. And it was awesome. You know, you get in. And a few scenes I remember from the movie were them watching, uh, you know, a baseball game on that little, small, throwback box TV. You know those two TVs that weigh like a million pounds? That was still in there. So I, I, I saw that, which was awesome. And then I walk over to the corner of the house, and you look out at the baseball field. And so many memories hit me. So many memories hit me looking out at that baseball field. I remember seeing the scene from the movie where, you know, the voices are talking to them and a baseball game's going on and it's raining. Like all, all these different scenes just hit me in that moment. I just thought how cool it was. So I, I leave the house and I go out back on the baseball field. And I'm like, I really want to walk through the corn. So it turns out the way you get around this whole complex, the way they set it all up was you walk through the movie site field Okay, so picture yourself at home plate of the movie site. You walk out through the outfield, just like all of the baseball players did in the movie, just like Shoeless Joe Jackson did, just like um, Kevin, Con Kevin Costner's character, Ray Kinsella, just like his dad did as he walked out to the corn. I got to make that walk, and so did everybody else there. I make that walk out to the corn. I walk through the corn, and it really, like, it hit me. And I wrote about this. I actually wrote about this. I said, you know, you think about this the whole time you're walking out there. Am I going to disappear once I get through the corn? And here's the thing, and I know this sounds cheesy. I'm not so sure I didn't. I'm not so sure I didn't walk through that corn and enter into a dream. It was perfect. You walk through and you enter this walkway over to where it leads you to the new big league stadium that was built. And this walkway is lined with these old school lights and music from the Field of Dreams playing. And this Field of Dreams music is playing and you just start getting emotional. And these lights are, are draped over the corn and you're just walking through this corn through with the music playing and you're leading towards the Major League Stadium. And there's cardboard cutouts of the players up like pressed up in the corn, which was really cool. And then there's an MLB maze that they had on the walk to the stadium. Now let me tell you about this maze. I did the maze. Do I regret doing the maze? Yes. 
I got lost in the maze, and I'm not kidding you guys. There's a video out there about this, and the maze was designed to look like the MLB logo. They did an awesome job. The aerial view, really cool. Inside, not so cool. My worst nightmare. I'm not good at mazes. I knew this going into it. I get in there, and you know, the first few minutes, I'm like, ah, oh, this is gonna be great. I'll get out of this. I didn't for a long, long time. And it was like 100 degrees outside. I'm in the middle of corn. I'm burning up. My cameraman, um, Adam is, is, is following me and he's like cussing me out. I, I find out at the end of this, he was like, dude, I was pissed at you. And I was like, I was pissed at myself. I couldn't get out of there. And I started like looking at my footprints in the ground, seeing which direction I had gone. It got really bad. It got really bad. I ended up making it out. It took about 30 minutes, but I legitimately got scared for a little while. So the MLB maze was not my favorite part of this. It actually scared me a little bit. And a real missed opportunity to call it the MLB maze, M-A-I-Z-E, you know, like corn, but they didn't. They just called it the regular maze, which, you know, you know uh, uh, an oversight there. Um, but you continue on after you come out of the maze to the stadium, and, and that's where, you know, that's where the game was played. And you guys saw it. was just incredible. And I, I can't speak enough about how magical this experience was. And it all led up to the baseball game. It all led up to the game that happened on Thursday night. And as I just spoke about, the game itself was perfect. And it all led to the Tim Anderson walk-off home run that shot the fireworks off in center field. Home runs were landing in the corn. The walk-off landed in the corn. It was perfect. It was a perfect game. And that leads me to my Twitter poll, where we asked, was this the best regular season baseball game you have ever seen? And the answer was yes. 57.9% of you said this was the best game, regular season-wise, that I have ever seen. 42.1% said no. 57.9% say yes. So one, thank you guys for voting. If you don't follow Flippin' Bass Pod, make sure you do it because weekly we have these polls. And look, I think we got this one right. I really do. For so many reasons, like I just said, this was more than a baseball game. This was a magical experience. This was a magical game. And you know what speaks volumes to this, to this answer? That more people watched this game than any other regular season game in 16 years. So I think we got this one right. I really do. So make sure you're following at Flippin' Bats Pod on Twitter for another reason other than just these weekly polls. But one thing I want to do, guys, every time I go to a cool experience like this is get something to give away to you guys. Whether, no matter what it is, just get a little something because I really, really appreciate you guys and I love you guys and I appreciate you all listening and the feedback we have and you following and you, you voting on this stuff. It makes the show so fun. So one thing I always want to make sure that I'm doing is giving back to you guys. And every trip I go on, I want to get something for you guys. So what I got from the Field of Dreams was that it's a 30th anniversary of the Field of Dreams uh, movie and, and the site. And I got the, a souvenir program from it with a really cool picture on the front. This is what, actually what sold me, was this picture on the front. Uh, it's really cool. And throughout it, it just you know, takes you through all of the history of this place and the history is what makes this so special so something i wanted to give away to you guys so make sure you're following at flipping bats pod on twitter and on all socials uh, to learn more about how you can get this and how the giveaway is going to work but thank you guys for voting on was this the best regular season game that we've ever seen thank you guys for voting i gave my opinion so did you and so did my guest kevin burkhardt an absolute legend I'm going to ask him, was this the best game you've ever seen? He's, he's done World Series. He's done Super Bowls. He's done it all. So I'm going to ask him, where does this rank? So let me welcome in my guest, an absolute legend and somebody I really, really respect and look up to in this industry, Kevin Burkhart. KB, thank you so much for joining me, man. I don't know how to live up to that, Ben, but I'll try, my <laughs> man. I appreciate it. Good to see you. You you live up to it just fine with, with all your hard work, and I appreciate it, and, and I, I really respect you. And KB, you were, you were there in Iowa, Field of Dreams game. I was boots on the ground for the digital side of things, getting a bunch of content on my end. But you guys on the TV side of things 
absolutely killed it. You guys crushed it, most viewed game in 16 years, and you were certainly a part of that. So I want to talk to you about that entire experience. And, and what was your first impressions of the place when you first rolled up into Dyersville, Iowa at the Field of Dreams? What was your first impressions? Did it blow you away? Yeah, you know, I mean, you and I got to talk a little bit out there, which was great. And, uh, you know, I, I think for me, I, I was excited to go do it uh, just because of the uniqueness of it. And, and obviously, I'd never been there. Um, I'd never even been the state of Iowa before, to be completely honest. <laughs> so I was excited uh, in the first hand. And then, you know, driving up when we went there on Wednesday, because we did a whole bunch of stuff Wednesday, and then we broadcast a youth baseball game at the actual Field of Dreams. You're just going down, as you know, you're going down this dirt road. There's nothing but corn, and then you make a right, and all of a sudden there's like a major league baseball field, and you're like, what? Um, so I, I was blown away. I mean, I, I, I knew it was going to be special, but when I got there, I, I thought it was incredible. I really did. And, and walking around, you know, the movie site and just taking it in and talking to the local people all week as, as I did as I got there on Monday, um, there's nothing I've ever really experienced quite like it. It was just so different and so unique and so um, you know, I used the word romantic when I was talking to my friends because that's what I felt like. You know, I felt like between the movie aspect and baseball and, and the, the people in that area were so cool. Uh, that's kind of the word I'm going with. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I had high expectations and I was blown away. And I don't know if you had any conversations like this, but I was talking to Lucas Giolito about it when they first showed up. And he said, yeah, we, we were excited to come here, but we had no idea it was going to be like this. He said, it's, it's perfect. It is perfect, and we had no idea, and we were absolutely blown away. And that's how I felt. It sounds like that's how you felt, and I'm sure plenty of other people felt that way. Did you talk to any players that felt that way too? You know, I, I, I think the players really bought in. That's what I really liked about it. You know, uh, we were walking after the, after the intro when they walked through the corn, and, and I saw Craig Kimbrell for a minute, and it's just like, this is pretty cool, right? You know, uh, so I, I, I got that same vibe. I think, like, hey, they were going, and, you know, it was relatively easy for them. They were close. Uh, you know, they were, their previous games on Wednesday were close, so they each flew in on Thursday. It was an easy flight. Um, and yeah, as a major league player, you know, it's, you're traveling a lot, you're like, oh man, we don't have a hotel, we're flying in and out. But I think when they got there, they're like, oh, this is pretty legit <laughs> yeah. type deal, yeah. I think for me, my favorite part of being there was taking, I, I FaceTimed my dad out on the field, which for me was a really cool moment. Uh, and I wish he would have been able to be there, but I, you know, I FaceTimed him and showed him around, and he was like, this is incredible. And then I walked through the corn, which was awesome. What, what was your favorite part of the experience? You know, I, I think, boy, that's a tough call. I, I mean, I could even go back to the youth game we did on Wednesday. It was that just was you know, seeing the kids' faces and, and broadcasting, you know, uh, a 14-year-old, 15-year-old kids playing on this field of dreams uh, where they actually shot the movie and the farmhouse is right behind us. You turn around and there it is. And, um, there was just a pureness to it, right? And then I really loved Kevin Costner, how he embraced the whole thing. I think that really made it uh, ultra special because, you know, he was on our pregame set for a while. And he was terrific, really enjoyed meeting him. And, and then obviously how he did the whole thing and leaving the players out of the corn, I, I just thought it was so good. And he loved it. You know, he's such a baseball diehard, and he was really uh, respectful and loves the movie, so he wanted to make it uh, magical. So I thought that whole scene for, you know, people at home and then people there it was just so good. I mean, I, I saw it obviously live there, but I went back and watched it, you know, three yeah. times at the beginning. I couldn't get enough. Yeah, of so it. did I. <laughs> I thought that set the scene, you know? Yeah, so did I. At any point, at any point in this whole trip, in the two days that you were there, um, did you ever get emotional at any part of anything that happened? You know, I, I, I think anyone did, can, you know, especially when we had Kevin on the set with us and, you know, just talking about, you know, you know Alex Rodriguez said something that was really personal on our set in that interview. He's like, hey, you know, this, this, this movie, among other things, yep. talks about, you know, father-son relationships. And Alex was like, my father left when I was 10. I never had that catch. And, you know, it goes back to any of your relationships, I think, right? So, of course, I, I, you think back to that and all those times and, and how that just resonates with you. I think it resonates. If, if it's not that exact thing, if it's not, you know, the father-son, I think there's, there's always some relationship that resonates in that way. So I think that's the beauty of it. The thing that I really took from it, one of the things, is that during the game, you know, you know pregame, during the game, 
and even the next day, I got texts from people who aren't even baseball fans, honestly. And they're like, that was amazing last night. So I think it, it was a way for everyone to kind of embrace how cool it was. That's what I liked. And hopefully there are more baseball fans now. Yeah. You talked about being on the set, which leads me to my favorite part of your week, which was the way you were dressed, KB. You killed it with your <laughs> outfit on game day on the set. I mean, absolutely killed it where where did that you know when did you realize what you were going to be wearing on the set was that your idea to go old school no so i mean listen i am nothing without uh without our amazing team at fox like vicky trilling and her incredible wardrobe staff uh you know fernanda and felicia and there's so many down there that do uh that do, i say down there because they're down by our dressing room yeah um but it was them, you know, and, 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 and I, I loved it. So, you know, they laid out some options and, and Felicia said, Hey, what do you think about this? And I tried it around and I just loved it. Cause I thought it was, you know, it was time frame reference, uh, you know, very cool, but it was kind of still modern in a way. Uh, I loved it. And <laughs> I just thought it was so cool that everyone did it. You know, and, and, and it wasn't only us, it was everyone there, you know, all the camera folks, yeah. all the behind the scenes folks, people work in the field. I don't know. Did you like it? I thought I had a blast doing it. That was one of my favorite parts is everybody bought in from you guys on TV where y'all absolutely killed it to the people that were working on the field wearing the suspenders. Like everyone in the entire experience bought in. And and you mentioned it. You mentioned how Costner bought into it and and how he, he loved the whole experience. And you got to talk to him about that on the stage. And it really did seem like from an outsider's perspective, I mean, I know I was, I was there and I could see it looked like he bought into it all, but you talked to him and, and it really did seem like he bought into this big time, right? No, he loved it. I mean, he loved everything about it. He, you know, he, he just, he, he wanted to keep the magic of the movie alive, right? So talking to all of our production folks who dealt with him, you know, not for us. I mean, he was great in our interview, but in terms of the whole open to the show, like he, he wanted it to be, you know, like the movie, he didn't want it to be cheesy, he didn't, you know, and, and I thought, I mean, he nailed it, right? I mean, of course he nailed it. Nailed he's it. an Academy Award winning actor, and he's one of the greatest to ever do it. But so I think to me, look, you can have a situation, there's so many things that had to go right for that. The site is magical just when you walk onto it, but certainly helps that the players bought in, certainly helps that you had a great game. But I, I think, I think that sets the scene, you know, especially for the people there, they're walking in and, and you know, they're walking in and they see the farmhouse and they walk through the corn maze and get to the field. But then when they see that, you could just tell, you know, after our pregame show, we all raced into the stands to kind of watch the beginning. Yeah. I knew what was going on. And people were just like, oh, you know, just kind of in awe of how neat it was. And I don't think there's many times, Ben, that, you know, Hollywood crosses over with sports in terms of like that. Yeah. It's, it's, like we were there because of Hollywood. And then it kind of turned into a Hollywood script the way the game played out. I think you're right. I think that kind of set the scene and like it, it immediately made everyone that tuned in to say, all right, I'll check out what this game is about. It, it ended up like they killed it with that. And, and everybody, Costner, the players, everybody on the TV side, one, all of all of our team on the TV side, the cameramen, they got the most incredible angles of all time of all of this happening. I just thought it was perfect. And it really did set the scene of this is going to be an event and you're not going to want to miss it. And man, it was so cool. And, and for me, the one thing that set the set the mood for me happened the day before when I saw you and Frank Thomas on the porch sling of the house at the other side, dressed up in your costumes, you guys absolutely killed it. You were Ray Kinsella. Frank was, uh, who, who was he? What was his guy's Terrence name? Terrence Mann. Terrence yeah, Mann. he was Terrence Mann. Like, it was incredible. And we're going to show that, we're going to show that picture. Uh, well, we have to at some point. But, but talk <laughs> about that, because your outfits were on point, And Frank looked exactly like Terrence. It was incredible. Well, it, it was it was. It was pretty funny. Like, so we did this skit that um, I put it out on Twitter. It's out there. I think our MLB social team did too. PT Navarro and our, and our production team was so amazing. They, they had this fun thing. They wanted to kind of recreate, uh, you know, not an exact scene from the movie, but we kind of did our own little pregame guys. So it was Poppy, A-Rod, Frank, and myself. And we were, you know, A-Rod and Poppy come out of the cornfield and Frank is there instead. <laughs> Frank gives up and gives them, you know, the, and I, I tell you, when I'm sitting next to Frank, I don't even know if you can see it in the shot, but the, the one shot that we cut, you know, we did a bunch of these lines uh, and then they edited it together brilliantly. 
But there's one point Frank, you know, gets up and he's dressed. He looks like him and he delivers this, you know, James <laughs> Earl Jones s baseball. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, I'm ready to die laughing because <laughs> I, I, I think in, I think in the one clip I'm kind of like smirking, I'm like breaking my lips like that deal. Uh, it, I mean, it was so much fun to do. I mean, we, I mean, we didn't. Uh, we I don't know. Maybe we took an hour shooting that, but you know, they edited it together like and it made it look incredible. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, please do. It's it's pretty funny. Yeah, it was it was awesome, and and I also saw Poppy and A Rod all dressed up in their uniforms, and Frank looked like he owned owned into it. What what was these guys' experience like? Did did everybody equally have an awesome experience? Were they blown away too? Yeah, so Frank had been there a bunch before because he had done. Oh uh, really? I think that was the sixth time he was there. Yeah, he had oh, been wow. there for multiple charity events and things. And you know, remember Frank lives in Chicago, so it's not a far ride for him. True, um, but. You know, he loves it there, and he, you know, saying so he kind of at least knew uh, what it was going to feel like and what it was going to expect, but he thought it was great. I mean, he thought that the whole thing was great, but Poppy and A-Rod hadn't been there. Um, and, you know, I just, it was cool living it through their eyes. You know, Poppy said, you know, for me, it's kind of, you know, it was like growing up for me in the Dominican, the only difference is instead of plantains, it was corn. And I thought that was such a cool line wow. that he dropped on the pregame show because, it, you know, it, I, I think it goes back to the pureness of it, right? It's really what it is. It's the, the sports pureness and at its roots. And um, so it was neat watching it through their eyes. I think they both thought it was pretty incredible. Yeah, it, it was really incredible. And, and it makes me wonder, and I've been wondering this ever since, like this was this was a big production and, and, and it wasn't put together overnight but it makes me wonder like this was such a success everybody on every platform killed it is, is this going to happen again do I know it'll happen again at the Field of Dreams that's already been said in 2022 there will be another game there but do you think we see another game somewhere else and where would you like to see a game played yeah, I mean, I do. I, look, I think baseball needed something like this. You know, mm -hmm. to be quite frank, I mean, there hasn't been a buzz like this over a regular season game. And a really, well, obviously, it's the highest rated game in 16 years. But, I mean, you go back to McGuire and Sosa. I mean, when people, like, were dying, dying to see regular season games. Obviously, the postseason is a star for Major League Baseball. It always has been all-star game. But, you know, game in August, to have that kind of buzz, I, I think the sport really, really needed it. So, I, I love going back. I think it was such a, uh, a special experience. Go back. I mean, it'll be tough to top, you know, admittedly, but I, I, I would go back in a heartbeat and they will. As far as anywhere else goes, look, I've been fortunate to see a game and a couple games in London. I thought that was incredible. I mean, I think you could play them, you know, around the world, right? I think there were multiple different spots uh, that you get to play at. You know, I think the one thing is you, you forget about, you know, the grassroots of it. The one thing that I learned being in Iowa and talking to everyone there is that they all love the game so much. They all were so excited for the game, even if they weren't going. Like, they're just so excited for the game yeah. to be there because they're kind of in that zone where they're Cubs fans, Twins fans, White Sox fans are kind of a, a mesh in that area. And, you know, so for them having that close by was cool. So I think besides being worldly, I think you could take Major League Baseball to places that have never had a game, and it would be spectacular. You know, I, I could name a bunch of states or a bunch of sites. Um, but I kind of like that idea. I like the grassroots type idea. Who knows? Maybe um, I'm not sure what's next. I haven't given it enough thought. But, um, you know, I, I like that as a startup idea for where to go next. I agree. And I was talking to some people the day of the game that weren't even – they were just – you know, some Iowans that showed up. I don't even know if they, I assume they had a ticket to the game, but this was over on the movie site. And, you know, time and time again, more so than anything, I just got, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. And I'm like, I, this wasn't my decision. I love being here, but like, you're welcome. And, and it just seemed that way. It just seemed like Iowans were generally thankful just that Major League Baseball decided to come to their state and that they could watch a Major League Baseball game in their home state. And and that's did you get that experience from talking to people? Uh, yeah, I got it all week. I mean, I you know go go and get coffee and people uh, unprompted would be like, oh my gosh, we're so excited for the game and you know we can't wait to watch baseball in Iowa and you know and and just. That's all everyone was talking about. Yep. Um, and I just thought the people, the, I thought the people were just so, I mean, I, I know that's the rep, right? We're in the Midwest, but gosh, people were so nice and so kind yep. and so welcoming. So, I mean, it was, a, it was a joy. It was a joy to be there. I mean, it really was, like I said, first time I'd ever been in the state, let alone in that area of Eastern Iowa. And um, I can't wait to go back. 
Well, this might be a tough question for you, and I know, you know, I, I talked about it earlier. You're a legend of this, and, you know, you've covered Super Bowls. You've covered World Series. You've done it all. You've done a lot, KB. And I want to know where this ranks. Where does this Field of Dreams experience rank for you and, and everything you've done? That's a really hard question, Ben. I mean, you know, yeah, I've been fortunate, right? I get to work on a lot of pretty amazing properties yeah. and, and go to these incredible events. So, and it's always easy to say, like, the latest event is, like, the best event, right? Because yeah. you just experienced it. I mean, I would say if I'm just going top of my head, uh, look, I've seen some really cool things, right? I mean, I was there for Johan Santana's no-hitter with the Mets, first ever in the history of the organization. The Cubs winning the World Series in 2016 and basically living in Chicago for that month, which was out of this world. Um, yeah, gone to the Super Bowls and done different things. I mean, if I'm taking right this second, I would say, you know, the Cubs World Series run because it was historical and because I don't think we'll ever see anything like that right. in the postseason. I think that's one and probably always going to be one. I gotta tell you, I think this might be too. I mean, it, it was it just just because of how unique it was, and how, and I know it was regular season, so I know that was there wasn't much on the line other than one regular season game, but it just felt so big and so unique and so different, and and I loved everything about it. So, you know, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of stuff, but it's up there, man. It's in the top three. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it was. It felt greater. It felt bigger than just a baseball game, for sure. Um, I have two things before I let you go. One, did you do the MLB maze that they had set up there? You know, I went in the beginning, but I, I actually got uh, pulled in to do something else. I didn't have enough time, so I, I did have a couple friends, and so I I have to do it next year. But I did have a couple friends that did it, and one of them got halfway in and bailed because they couldn't find their way out. Did you do it? Yeah. Yeah, I would be one of your friends that did it, and I got lost in there for 30 minutes, KB. I'm not kidding you. It was, it like started off like, all right, this is going to be good content. I'm going to go in. And then 20 minutes later, I'm lost in there. It's 100 degrees. I'm yelling at helicopters to come save me. It was actually, it was, it was actually crazy in there. And I, I was a little hesitant for a second because I didn't know if, if I was going to get out. Um, That's what I heard. I, yeah, really bad. And also... I know you said your favorite part was, but I'm a little disappointed that the favorite part of your whole trip wasn't uh, me singing karaoke. I really thought I would. I really thought that was going to be your favorite experience, and I'm not sure why it wasn't. Thoughts? I actually um, immediately purged that from my memory because it it is, <laughs> it is scarred me for life. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. KB, thank you so much for joining me, man. I really, really appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your day. And, uh, you know, good luck the rest of the season and keep killing it, my man. Good to see you, Ben. See you soon. All right. See ya. All right. And I wanted to thank Kevin Burkhart again for joining me, an absolute legend of the game. So it was awesome to hear his experience. And he loved it as much as I did with boots on the ground at the Field of Dreams game in Iowa. And again, congratulations to the whole TV side for absolutely killing it and putting together a perfect product uh, for tons and tons of people to watch. But now it is time for my favorite segment this week and Shohei Otani News presented by Mattress Firm. So talk to an expert and unjunk your sleep today. Look, I actually got to meet up with the Mattress Firm people at their trailer in Iowa, and I got to talk to my own personal sleep expert, Tracy, and look at all of the beds. It was awesome. It was great to talk to her. It was great to learn a lot about it because I myself sleep on a Mattress Firm mattress. So you should unjunk your sleep as well. But look, now it is time to get into it with this week in Shohei Otani news. And guys, he did it again. Everything this week, from the hitting to the pitching. We got stats for you. He did it all. So let's get right into it with his hitting. I sat here last week and I told you guys, do not worry about his hitting. Shohei Otani is fine. I heard a lot of people talking about him. He's, why is he struggling? Why is he struggling? Well, he had that three-game series against the Dodgers where he could only get a few at-bats, and then he got walked in most of those at-bats. This week, this week he was back. He hit home runs number 38 and 39, but aside from just the home runs that we all see, he got eight hits this week. 
Shohei Otani got eight hits this week, a bunch of doubles, a couple homers, four RBIs, even a couple stolen bases. The guy is back. The guy never left, like everybody was thinking. So I sat here last week and I told you, do not worry about his hitting. And what he did this week was dominate at the plate. Dominate. And speaking of dominating, I want to talk about his pitching start this week. He threw against the Toronto Blue Jays in a much-anticipated matchup against the Blue Jays because Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is another MVP front-runner, if you will, besides Shohei Otani. So they get to face off this week. Otani throws great. Six innings, three hits, two runs, six strikeouts, lowers his ERA. His ERA, by the way, is 2.9. Three. He's now 7-1 with a 2.93 ERA. Since the beginning of July, this is the best pitcher in baseball. Since the beginning of July, the best pitcher in baseball is one home run away from 40 on the season. This is nuts, guys. This is insane. So let me hit you with a few stats. His 7-1 record, good for the best winning percentage in all of baseball as a pitcher. Best winning percentage with a 7-1 ERA. Now look at this. In 2021 with pitchers with 12 plus starts, look at these numbers. All of his stats rank in the top 15 to 20 of pitchers. So just pitching, which is what we're talking about right now, his dominant start this week and his dominance since the beginning of July. Just pitching, his numbers are great. They're in the top 15 to 20 in every category until you get to win percentage, where he's number one amongst all of pitchers. So you look at the stats that Shohei Otani is number one in win percentage as a pitcher. Pretty big one. Let's look at the other ones. Not to mention just those. He's also the MLB leader in home runs, extra base hits, slugging percentage, and war, which is wins above replacement. These numbers are just getting ridiculous, guys. And I've tried to tell you all year long, it is special what we're seeing. And this was a big matchup this past week. It wasn't just another start. You know, he faced off against the Toronto Blue Jays. And I actually went on a radio station in Toronto earlier last week when, when they wanted to preview this little matchup. And they even kind of admit it. It kind of feels like Shohei Otani has a huge lead when it comes to the MVP leader. And I agreed. And they said, what if, what if Vlad goes in and faces him and hits a home run? I feel like that might help him catch up a little bit. And I said, you know, I, I don't know. If, if he hits a home run and Otani doesn't have a great week, yeah, I'm sure that gap will close. But what happened was the opposite. Otani threw great against him. He didn't hit a home run against him. Otani hit a home run that series. Otani hit a double in that game he started against Vlad Jr. And the gap continues to go in the other direction. Shohei Otani Jr., Vladimir Guerrero Jr. struggled. He struggled in that series. And Shohei Otani is separating himself. That MVP race, that MVP race is getting further and further in Shohei Otani's direction. And I love to see it. That's my pick. That's my pick. I love to see it. So I mentioned he's the league leader in war. Let me explain to you guys what that means. War is wins above replacement. Okay, wins above replacement. Now, there's a whole, you know, it, it can be complicated when you look at it from the outside, but wins are above replacement. What it does is takes all of these stats, runs scored, hits, all of this stuff, combines it, and they have this formula to create wins above replacement. It's quite literally a very, very good and important stat to use. You can use it for any player throughout history. Shohei Otani has a combined war between hitting and pitching of 7.4. 7.4, the next closest in the league isn't even at a six, guys. The next closest player in Major League Baseball when it comes to war isn't even at a six, which is just astounding to think about. That's just how good he is. That's how good he is. You combine his hitting and his pitching, and he just creates this superhuman, which is what we have, this superhuman that is now taking the league by storm and is well, well on his way to winning an MVP, in my opinion. 
So yeah, look at this. Leads the league with a 7.4 war. There isn't anybody close. Uh, also in his start the other day, this was a great post, I thought. One of my favorites. Shohei Otani was the winning pitcher and batted leadoff. He has a 1.69 ERA since the 1st of the July. He leads the league in homers, and he's incredible. You heard it. You heard it straight from MLB's mouth. You heard it straight from them. That's my favorite point. You just add in at the end, he's incredible. It's true, guys. It's true. He's having an incredible season, and he did it all this week. He did it all. From the hitting, hitting two bombs, he's now one away from 40. So we're on kind of, you know, 40 is not necessarily a milestone, but when you're in the middle of August, 40 is a milestone. Okay? So we're one away from a big milestone homer for him at 40. He threw great. He got the win on the mound. He's 7-1. and one. He has the best winning percentage of any pitcher in baseball. He has more bombs than anybody, and he has the highest war of anybody. So just another incredible week for this week in Shohei Otani news. And before I move on, I wanted to talk about this incredible, incredible set we have here. You know, and I need to give a shout-out to Beverly Pham and Ryan Ensign for, for this. This is incredible. And I really appreciate all the hard work you guys put in. And I hope everybody that listens and watches this show um, appreciates what we have here because we have an incredible set for an incredible player that's having the most incredible season in Major League Baseball history. So I feel like that is kind of fitting. And that does it for this week in Shohei Otani News. All right, so obviously we just finished up the Field of Dreams game. So it really got me to thinking. And I saw a bunch of people online talking about this as well. What other stadiums could we do? What other cool spots would there be to watch a baseball game? And it really got me to thinking. And I came up with five five different stadiums or locations that I would love to see a game like we just saw in a new location. So let's start with number five, the Polo Grounds. Now, this one is a little bit different than the others. I know the stadium isn't currently still there, but I would love to see a baseball game, a Major League Baseball game, at the Polo Grounds. So maybe they, they rebuild the stadium for this. But the Polo Grounds is a stadium in New York now let me tell you why I think this would be fascinating. I play at the Polo Grounds in MLB The Show, and it is such a crazy stadium that people, it's like really toxic to play there. So, the Polo Grounds down the left field line, the dimensions were about 250 feet, okay? 250. Left center and right center, the gaps, 450. The gaps are 450. And then center field, Center field is 483 feet. And then you move over to right field where it's literally like 230 something. So I just, I can't imagine seeing a, a game in that stadium. It used to be an old polo park. I would love to watch it, the nonsense that would go on at, uh, at that stadium. But moving on to number four, Coney Island. I would love to see a Mets and Yankees game on Coney Island. I've actually gotten to play there. there. There is a team that plays there, the Brooklyn Cyclones. They play on Coney Island, and it's really cool. The reason I think it'd be cool for a major league game to be there, specifically Yankees-Mets, because it just, you know, it, it has to be them. Uh, but it's like, it's like an amusement park there. They got the Nathan's Hot Dog, the original Nathan's Hot Dog. They got a, a roller coaster out in the outfield. I just think it'd be awesome to watch a game there. Number three, Old Tiger Stadium. This one's... A little personal for me, I, I grew up obviously going to a bunch of games in Detroit and Old Tiger Stadium is still there. And I never got to go inside of it, but it is still there and there's so much history there. And Reggie Jackson hit a home run there off the light tower and it's just, it almost went out of the stadium. There's a lot of history in that stadium. And I, I used to pass it every single day and think, man, I would love to see a game in that stadium. And that still holds true and it is still there, so I wish one day MLB would get to play a game in there. I think that'd be awesome. Number two, I would love to see Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Angels play a Major League Baseball game in the Tokyo Dome in Japan. I think that would be so cool. Um, look, obviously the connection there with, with Shohei and Japan would be awesome. I also think that the Tokyo Dome is one of the coolest venues there is. You know, you watch games there and it, it's awesome. It gets crazy. The crowd loves it. So what I would love to see is Shohei Otani and the Angels play a game there. And I guarantee you the atmosphere would be unlike anything that we have ever, ever seen. So that would be number two. And then number one, run it back, baby. Kevin Costner, Bull Durham. 
We're running it back in Durham, North Carolina, where the Bull, you guys remember, if you haven't seen Bull Durham, you need to, but it's a great stadium. They got the, the Bull out in left field. I think it's moved now, but the Bull is still there. So I would love to see a major league game there. I think it'd be cool if you do two teams that are close-ish, you know, like meet in the middle, have the Braves and the Nationals play there. I mean, imagine Ronald Acuna Jr. hitting a homer off the Bull. Hit the Bull, win a stake as it says. That'd be awesome. So I'd love to see that, a, a Major League Baseball player hitting the bull and the tail wagging and the smoke going everywhere. Kevin Costner walking back, on, back out on the field, talking to Nuke Lelouch. Man, that would be a great one. So look, I just, I, I, it got me to thinking. The Field of Dreams was awesome, playing a game in the middle of a cornfield. What else could we do? So I named it. I would love to see five games in those five locations. Uh, and I think it'd be really cool to see that in the future. Before I head out a little extra innings today, and it's all about Miguel Cabrera. Miguel Cabrera is one home run away from 500. Miguel Cabrera is, in my opinion, one of the greatest right-handed hitters that we have seen this era. You know, I look at Edgar Martinez, I look at Albert Pujols, and I look at Miguel Cabrera. And I think a lot of us have forgotten because over the last couple of years, he hasn't been the same hitter. But this guy was dominant, and I was there. I was there watching him in his, in, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013. He won a triple crown. This guy is one of the best hitters we've seen in this game. And I've gotten, you know, I got the opportunity to get closer to him, you know, growing up in that organ, being around that organization. Here's a cool picture of me with him in the locker room when I was like, 21, but I look 15. Um, you know, I, I really respect the way he has played this game, and he is one home run away from 500. And this is, this is personal to me. I have a personal con connection. I tweeted this the other night when he hit his 499th. Miguel Cabrera will end tonight one home run away from 500. And I really do. I think I'm going to get a little emotional when this happens. You know, Miguel Cabrera, when I was younger and, and playing in college, I would go down and hit in the cage in Comerica when my brother was playing in Detroit, and, and he'd be down there, and he'd talk to me a lot about hitting and talk to me a lot about his approach. And as a young guy just trying to make it in baseball and just trying to get drafted one day and play professional baseball, I can't tell you how much that meant to me. Having a guy like him who is a future Hall of Famer and one of the best to ever do it, and specifically one of the best right-handed hitters to ever play, that meant a lot. And Miguel Cabrera is one home run away from 500. You know who they play this week? They play the Los Angeles Angels. You know who's probably going to pitch against them this week? Shohei Otani. Now, not that I ever want to root for Shohei Otani to give up a home run. But let me tell you this. If Shohei Otani gives up his 500th home run, gives up, gives up the 500th home run to Miguel Cabrera, and then later in that game hits his 40th home run, I think my head would explode. I literally think that would be the end of me. So not that I'm rooting for Shohei to give up a home run, but I am rooting for Miguel Cabrera to hit that 500th home run. And I just think it would be so poetic if it happened on that day. And if it does, somebody check on me, please, because I will not be okay. But thank you guys so much for listening. The Field of Dreams special. And again, if you guys haven't yet, Make sure you're following at Flippin' Bats. I love giving stuff away when I go to cool events, and I'm going to give away this souvenir. I can't believe that I got through this episode, this Field of Dreams episode, without saying something corny. Honestly, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure you're following all the socials, Twitter, Instagram, at Flippin' Bats Pod everywhere. Check it out on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you rate it five stars. Leave a review. Uh, I would really appreciate it. And I will see you guys next time on Flippin' Bats. A high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate.